Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Right. Uh, Vaikuji Khalsa, Vaikuji Khalid, and uh, good evening. Uh, you know, there are, just to be clear about the agenda for this evening, for about 45 minutes or 50 minutes, I'll go over specifically what transpired in November 84, what you just heard about. And then we can get into question and answer sessions and we can go beyond that topic. You know, I think there needs to be much more contextualization which needs to occur as to what happened in 84 itself, not just that something which happened in November and then you heard about what happened in June. But there is much more going on between June and November and before that and after that. And sometimes, if we don't have the larger context, we end up making them unfortunate events. And that's in courts because this is what the Prime Ministers of India have called them, unfortunate events. They're not unfortunate events. They are part of a larger thesis. But in the interest of time in today's context, uh, in today's topic, I'll just talk about what happened in November 84. Um, um, this is roughly the agenda. We do want to talk about how it fits into the larger framework of what's happening worldwide. Uh, I'm looking at the faces here. Most of you maybe weren't even born in 84. So this is a post-84 generation. Some of you might, maybe you were infants at the time, and few of you were born before that. To contextualize this at a larger world level, we need to understand what kind of atrocities are taking place in your life, lifetime. The ones you relate to, or you know, everyone knows about the Arab Spring and what just happened in Libya. So you know, there's a picture which just recently surfaced of Gaddafi meeting Mrs. Gandhi. And if you look at the fates of both individual and their sons, you'll get a lot of contextualization to what happened in '84 as well. So similarly, if you look at, uh, there have been tribunals throughout the world wherever there have been genocidal campaigns, whether it includes uh, sub-African countries or whether it includes uh, places like Bosnia. Similar things need to happen within the Indian context, and because they haven't happened, we have to come here and talk about these events, and hopefully some of you won't be able to sleep at night and figure out what to do about them. So that's the idea, and that's why I want to start with, what does UN have to say about these kind of campaigns? And why are we not able to declare genocide as to what happened in 84, but when the campaign for Save Darfur occurred, they were able to declare uh, genocide. So there is there's a work required to get even get uh, what happened in '84 to be labeled as genocide. We'll get into a little bit on the sequence of events, but you heard a fairly good background. I want to get into what makes it genocidal. What was the role of police, administration? Uh, how did the media report these things? And I'll get a little bit into personal testimony. I was there in India at the time. Uh, outside Punjab, because most of November 84 was actually outside Punjab, primarily in Delhi, and secondarily in UP and other uh, cities, uh, uh, one or two south cities as well, but mostly north and north central cities. And we'll get into the update as to what's happening regarding specifically November 84 cases. I had a long conversation with Mr. Fulka, the only guy who was fighting these cases at, at, at the court level, legal level, uh, three days ago, and I'll share some of those, and uh, we'll end with what can you and I do about these things. So that's roughly the agenda. You can read on screen what UN calls genocide, and I've highlighted a few things, and this is what we need to look into a bit. Basically, you've heard the term genocide quite a bit now, but special, specifically it means it's killing members of the group. So our six, specifically a group, we have to think about these things. Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about this physical destruction in whole or in part. My point here is, uh, within the world politics, and, where, and there is a politics of genocide as well. That's why every major conflict in, in the world is not a gen of genocide. And I don't know how many of you realize, but essentially if UN declares a particular conflict to be a genocide, then every member country's moral duty is to go intervene. So this is the politics. If you don't declare it, then countries don't have to do anything about it. So to get even, like Armenians haven't been able to get their things uh, uh, labeled genocide, but only last year US Congress voted to call it a genocide, like 90 years later or something like that. So the point is, 
as much as we want to label certain genocides, there's international politics, there's international law involved, and that's probably one of the reasons why it's not labeled genocide. But if you go by the definition which was primarily constructed in 1940s post-Nazi Germany phenomena, the definitions were used to convict or run Nuremberg trials. And the definitions haven't been changed. So again, another thing to keep in mind is when we are dealing at a world level, we are still operating at an older level of definitions. Those definitions haven't been updated. And if some of you are pursuing law, and within it, human rights law, think about not just being a litigation lawyer, but becoming a policy lawyer. Because that's where, uh, what they say, rubber meets the road. If you don't qualify to be a genocide, then there won't be interventions to stop the genocide. So that's the world context, and let's get into you heard the sequence of events of it, and that's what's written there. The only thing I'm going to say here is, you will hear this all the time, which is, and by the way, I'm not here to present Indian government side. Am I biased? You bet I am. You know, I'm not here to present to you what Indian government says, what Indian papers say. My job primarily is to tell you what the sick narrative is. And the, within the sick narrative, I am going to contextualize what the world press and the people who are orchestrating this was doing. It's, if I'm going to stand here and tell you about Holocaust, what Hitler and his state agency had to say, that makes no sense. So don't expect that from me. You can get that from Indian government's white paper. My job is to present to you what makes it a safe case, and how should six look at this. And within that, I'll try to present some statistics, some anecdotal evidence. And, uh, and by the way, the world has seen its Holocaust deniers, and they exist in England as a professor who is here. But that doesn't mean Holocaust didn't happen. Similarly, their denials of what happened in 1984 in November, I'm not here to make their case here. You can go attend their lectures, and when they come to visit from India and their state agencies, my role is to make a case as to what happened and make you feel as a sick why you need to be relevant to these things. So the only thing I'm going to add in this sequence of events is when we present June 1984, we almost always present the Indian government's version. We end up saying, and you heard in the introduction today because that's what mostly most of the websites and books are writing, is that the government of India went inside the war sub-complex to capture Pedramale and his men. This is what's written in Indian government's white paper. White paper implies a visual version of the Indian government. But that's not true. By their own accounts, the Indian parliament, after the so-called quote-unquote Operation Blue Star, in their debate in parliament said that the people we went to capture in the Varsa complex by their own admittance, more than 38 of them were not even in the country. Second thing I want to point out is DC of Compressor, which is a deputy commissioner, the guy who is in charge of the civil administration. Mr. Barar is on record saying, I said to the government of India at that time, give me the arrest warrants and I will go arrest Pindravani and his men. He was not, there were no warrant arrests. So the larger thesis of even June 84 needs to be contextualized. And in the introduction, uh, you mentioned Joyce Pettigrew, and that's what it is. That's one way to look at it, that the government went inside the temple uh, not to capture a political figure or kill a political movement. It was to attack Sikh spirit, Sikh psyche, and Sikh nation. And you better believe it. The reason I say that is the person who planned the whole attack Lieutenant General S.K. Sinha, don't believe anything I'm telling you, go check it out and you can Google anything you want these days. Lieutenant General S.K. Sinha was ordered by the Prime Minister's office 18 months before June 84 to plan the attack. He's on record saying this. There's a, in fact, he was recently interviewed on Indian TV and he put it just like that. He says, I was given 18 months to plan attack. So you know when the government of India says, that we went inside the temple with prayer on our lips and as a last resort, it's a bunch of baloney. Because the guy who did the planning said he went into Chakrata and Doon Valley, create replicas of the Varsav complex, and his job was to create the third largest amount of damage. He said in August 1983, he was told to now prepare for implementation. The planning is done. August 1983, much before June 84. So this is very calculated stuff. This is not the kind of things, you know, that instantaneously a political figure had, as I said earlier, were, was creating troubles. There was nothing like that. That's not the sick narrative. And then he said the information leaked in April 1984. 
And he says when he was asked to go invade the Darbar Sahib complex and 38 other Gurdwaras in Punjab, he said, yeah, I refuse to do it. His name is Lieutenant General S.K. Sinha. Because he said, I have taken the oath of army on the Indian constitutions to attack the enemy, not my own citizens. He was removed from his position. Two sycophants were brought in. Two, uh, two six sycophants were brought in. Uh, their names are R.S. Dayal and T.S. Barar. And Indian government used those two generals under the orders of General Vaidya and General Sundarji to go invade the WhatsApp complex. So that's the context I want to start with. Don't just follow narrative of the ones who are persecuted. That would be like following the Nazi Germany's propaganda machine. They are the ones who deny they did those things. So we have to also look at, you know, the, there's a movie called Is Paris Burning? You must watch it if you haven't seen it. And there's this guy who was ordered by Hitler to go loot Paris, and then whatever he's not able to loot, go burn it. And the whole movie is about that. Similar things happened in June 84. You heard a, a part of that footnote that not only was it invaded, but the Sikh reference library, according to the admittance of India's defense minister, George Fernandez, they took 16 Shakti Man trucks, which is an army truck of India, material from Sikh reference library, and whatever they couldn't take it, they burned it. So this is very, very calculated, guys. This is not that they went inside again to capture a political figure or to kill a political movement. It was attack on Sikh psyche. And within that psyche, you can try to contextualize what Bayan Singh and Satwan Singh did. You know, Indra Gandhi's two bodyguard. It's very similar to Sikh historical narratives. Like when there were dancing girls produced in the Rwarsab complex, you know, two diaspora Sikh. And I call them diaspora because anyone who lives outside of Punjab are diaspora, even within Indian confines, because the boundaries of India were established in 1947. So they were the diaspora. And back in those days, uh, when they were dancing in the Rwarsab complex, uh, we proudly talk about it in the Sikh history, uh, two individuals from Rajasthan, Sukha Singh and Natab Singh, went to, to deliver justice in the Rwarsab complex. But that's not the topic today, that's the context. Let's get into once there was this assassination, what happened? Well, let me put a narrative here of President of India first. Whatever his politics, Kushwan Singh, and whatever his writings, we are on the topic of discussion today, on when this started in November, when the anti-Sikh killing started, the leading so-called writer of India, the guy who used to be editor of Illustrated Weekly of India, Kushwan Singh, he's still around, he called President of India, who happens to be a Sikh also, Jal Singh. And he said to Jal Singh, I need help, people are attacking my house. The sitting President of India says, I can't help you. Go wherever you can get help. What does that tell you? June, forget June, November 84, was not about any political party also. It didn't even matter if you were Congress six. In fact, most of the six who were killed in Tilokpuri have always voted for Congress party. November 84 was about killing as many Sikhs as possible outside Punjab. June through November, Operation Blue Star so-called, Operation uh, uh, Woodrose, there were multiple operations, were all within Punjab. And this one sometimes, Dr. Sangat Singh, who worked for Indian Government Intelligence Agency, he says this operation was called Operation Shanti. And they were going to target Sikhs outside Punjab and kill them. And the assassination of Mrs. Gandhi was used as a pretext to pre pwn the event and kill as many as possible at that time. What did they do then? Well, th these are some of the things which uh, people talk about as to what happened in those three days. Well, first is there were Congress-led meetings and distribution of weapons. So when people say, you know, in the genocidal campaigns, there has to be some system to the madness, as they call it. And the system is they have water lists. They have identified sick houses. Well, how are these people bust from a different location to a different location? So let's say if somebody lives in West Delhi, they are put in bus and trucks and they are taken to South Delhi. And the ones from Trans Jamna, which is across the river, they are brought from Trans Jamna into West Delhi. Who is busing them? Who is supplying them kerosene oil? Who is supplying them the water registration list? Obviously, it's the government and agencies. Uh, slogans of extermination. I remember this. I was uh, 12 years old at the time. And my family, right after this, you know, uh, migrated to US. Uh, I remember on Doordarshan, the, all the TVs and radios were run by state media. And when you have people like popular heroes like Amitabh Bachchan going on TV and other Congress members going on TV and saying, Khun ka badala khun, blood for blood, what does that really mean? 
when they go on TV and say people in Punjab have poisoned the rivers, although nothing was going on, it's supposed to excite the mobs. You know, the river Punjab rivers have been poisoned, which means the water actually is all taken out of Punjab, which they admit, and goes to Haryana, Rajasthan, Delhi. And they're saying that six are poisoning the river water, so more Indians will die. Complete blanket lie. There was nothing, no even news report appeared that six had done that. But by saying these kind of things, they're exciting mob mentality. And mob mentality then overtook not just the party workers, but non-Congress party workers. To the level where the opposition party, although a couple of their leaders on record saying that this is not an acceptable thing, but RSS, which is now a popular term, uh, which refers to the think tank of the right-wing BJP party, Bharti Janta Party, their official paper called The Organizer put out an editorial justifying the violence. So this was not just Congress who was after it. It is also the opposition parties are also create, uh, uh, caught up into this, we'll call a uh, national sort of uh, outcry to kill as many Sikhs as possible. Uh, and it wasn't rumors I just talked about, attacks on Sikh dignity, symbols, and structure. What I mean by that is, we know whether an individual keeps hair or not is their personal prerogative, but in Sikh psyche, somebody coming to cut your hair is a huge thing. And if you want testimonies on this, SikhSheik.com is running a whole campaign to record oral and written testimonies. You can go on there and see how many testimonies are there. Recently, Harinder Kaur from Seattle has put out her testimony, how in June 1984, within the Darbar complex, they tried to forcefully cut her hair and uh, sexually abused her. The point is, this was taking place. Making fun of Kakars, making fun of Ks, cutting their Ks. Uh, some families themselves do it, other families were pressured to do it, others were burned. Uh, urinating on Gurdwaras, urinating on Darwasa, uh, on the uh, Guru Granth Sahib's roots. This is what is meant by uh, um, attacking, uh, attacks on Sikh dignity symbols and structures. Death squads everywhere, sexual violence. One of the first magazines to report about sexual violence. And by the way, there hasn't been a single case of rape filed yet. We are still finding the higher cases, you know, of just the killings and the loot and the arson. But the first reports, and I'll show you a cover of that magazine, was filed by a magazine, women's magazine called Manushi, where what the editor did was she went to these relief camps and she was just collecting stories of women. And that in, in itself is very powerful as to how, and you know this, that soldiers do this all the time. Uh, and you will hear the stories from Eastern Europe to Africa and wherever the genocidal campaigns have been and killings that rape is used as a tool, again, to attack dignity and to kill the spirit. And it was done in those days as well. The refusal of medical care, attacks of the media, and I'll, basically I'm gonna try to establish all these through some evidence now, and let me get into that. Role of the police. Now you can read the slide, but effectively what was happening was this. If a police guy saw somebody is being killed, they turned their face other way. In some cases, police provided the ammunition to go kill. In other cases, the DGP of uh, Delhi is on record saying that I am trained, the guy who, actually not DGP, sorry, the guy who is in charge of Indian Police Academy's trainings, he is on record saying that they are trained to contain any riot, quote unquote riot, and I'll get into the politics of the word riot. He says, we are trained to contain any riot within two hours. He says, we were never ordered to contain this. The guy who does the training of Indian Police Academy says this. You can see other things written there, but basic issue is this, that police, uh, in fact, recently there was an article which talked about uh, Mr. Fulk actually has filed a case in this as well, where in one police station, there are more than 383 deaths within the confines of jurisdiction of one police station. And on that day, there is no FIR filed. FIR is called First Information Report. So this is, when you go to police station and something happens, you're supposed to file an FIR. So when six or non-six are approaching to file FIR, they are not being registered. If uh, Police is not ordered to contain quote unquote riot. Police officers, in some cases, are assisting, in other cases, looking, in the case of looking the other way when they see the violence being inflicted on the six. So, manipulation of records, systematically disabling and neutralizing officers, ordering policemen to disarm six, 
there's another interesting thing happening. So if there are six appearing to defend themselves and their gurdwaras and their businesses and their women, then if there, is a, there is a very famous case where a lot of six, when their uh, property and their houses were being burned, they were gathered at gurdwaras. So gurdwaras serve this function. For those of you who are interested in what else gurdwaras are supposed to do, other than just teaching you kirtan and nam, there these are the community centers. This is where people gathered. This is where from where the responses were being developed. So whichever gurdwara would have most six, police will actually go there and disarm the six, so they can't even defend their gurdwara. You know, the, one, one of the things in Sikh psyche is, you know, you can loot me and you can kill me and you can do other things, but we are definitely going to protect the Gurdwaras. And this is in the Sikh psyche in June and other incidents, but within November 84, this happened in uh, Darbar South Complex as well. Um, just to correlate this, officers who helped in doing this stuff, they were rewarded, they were given medals, they were given promotions. Now, just to contextualize this, that this is happening even today. I'll tell you how this is happening. Last week, there was a recommendation to make a new DGP in Punjab. The guy whose name surfaced, his name is Sumed Saini, one of the most notorious officers of Punjab police, who is heavily credited with killing most amount of six, raping women, ordering all sorts of things between 87 and 93. One of the Indian intelligence officers, who is retired now, his name is M.K. Dhar, he went to the media and his report is published. You can go Google it. Just disappeared last week. He advised Badal, the chief minister of uh, Punjab right now. He says, my advice is please do not make him the DGP. You know what he has done. If you do this, you are inciting Sikh violence again. Because Sikhs know what this guy has done and now you want to make him the chief of Punjab police. So this is how people are rewarded. This is continuing. Some of you might be wondering, 84, 27 years. Why does all these things matter? Well, because similar patterns, similar rewards are still continuing, and the culture of impunity is ever persistent. Let's get a manipulation of records. I just talked about it, that when the victims were showing up, they will not record it. If they record it, they won't write what the victim is saying, the police won't. And many a time, you won't even get a copy of it. So you don't know whether they even filed it, even if they wrote that down. Uh, and uh, if you want uh, actual records of these, these were produced by Mr. Folka in front of uh, Indian Court and CBI and Human Rights Commissions and National Human Rights Commission. Uh, we have digitized every single copy of these, the actual affidavits. If you go to Punjab Digital Library, you can Google and look at every single one of these documents, which are now available to public, every single document which has been used here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the planning. I talked about Congress party actually planning this. If you want the names, one of the first lists, investigative reports which were produced as to what happened in Delhi is called Who Are the Guilty? By two professors from Delhi, uh, Gobinde Mukte and Rajni Kudhari. It's a very short, like a booklet, you know, this is a classic booklet available in one of the first reports of November 84. And they have listed which sitting MPs, which sitting ministers, which municipal corporation leaders came and identified the sick houses and the sick properties and directed the attacks. So this is not something which is rhetoric or manufactured stuff. This is documented stuff. Uh, Non-deployment of army. Army, as you, I talked about how the police was not deployed, although they're supposed to, to contain any quote unquote riots again. And by the way, riot is a wrong word. I don't know how many times the Indian media needs to be told this. Every year there's a discussion around this time on IBN, ANI, their, their partners of Reuters and BBC in India. They continue to use the same word. The word riot implies two sides are fighting. There were the two sides fighting here. If there were two sides fighting, how come all the casualties are on one side? Riot is a wrong term. This is to minimize the pain and to misconstrue what really happened that day. At minimum it should be called pogrom or carnage or massacre. Uh, some people have clearly established by former, by former Chief Minister, uh, sorry, Chief Justice of India, uh, Justice Sikri. He wrote a book called Citizens Report. And there he said it, this was a pre-planned attack orchestrated by rulers of India. This is not a Sikh guy writing this. This is Justice Sikri, who was a former Chief Justice of India, right? So these are the kind of things we need to get into. And he says, non-deployment of army, which means army should have been brought in. 
if a particular ruling party is doing this, it's army job to contain if the own citizens are doing certain things. Inadequate relief measures, there were relief camps first started by the citizens at large, eventually government did it, but after 15 days they started closing because the international attention was coming to it. Why are these relief camps there? So they just turned them off. Like go home, go home to where? The houses have been burned. So though a late start, uh, they started up late and then they closed them off. The government camps were closed off in two weeks. The private camps stayed there to provide uh, water and testimonies and recording and other things. There was censorship of the press. I've just highlighted a few people who have written about this. Uh, James Markham and Barbara Crossett of New York Times have talked about how their stories were not allowed to go out. Uh, Ravi Prakash Jain of Surya Magazine. Lots of correspondents from American, Canadian, and other Indian periodicals talk about how their versions of stories were not being published or being allowed to leave India. So the point is, uh, what we see in those three days is essentially not just the killings, but also when you wonder how come more more stories didn't come out by the news media because there was censorship at the time. And this is one of the uh, pictures from one of the relief camps. So you can see the idea of relief camp is not exactly what we think in today's age. You know, it was more uh, temporary things and sometimes not even a tent on top of their bodies. This is a magazine which I talked about, which highlighted the, the women atrocities. And you know, the, Madhu Kishwar is a senator. Uh, whatever people might think of her, you got to you know, hats off to her for actually highlighting this issue against all odds in those days. And look what she wrote. Madhu Kishwar is not a Sikh. This is not a Sikh magazine. This is a journal about women in society. And they show a woman from a relief camp in November 1984. And she highlighted this, that look what they did to her in the name of national unity. And this is a classic phrase used in India. In fact, the Speaker of the Indian Parliament is on record in 1984, Balram Chakar, his name is. He is on record saying, Speaker of Indian Parliament, to eliminate, to maintain the integrity of India, if we have to eliminate 25 million six, we will do so. Can you imagine this? It's like your Parliament's House of Commons Speaker gets up and makes a statement like this. So there is a criminalization of governance going on. This is why nothing is being done about it. The Indian Parliament Speaker says we'll eliminate 20 million six to maintain integrity of India. And this is probably one of the reasons why Madhu Kishwar is writing this. That in the rhetoric of maintaining national unity, we are violating our own citizens' rights. And they are obviously their honors. This is another report which came out and on Indian governance. Two lessons can be drawn from the experience of the Delhi riots. Ignore the word riots. Remember, even the ones who talk about it, they still keep using the word riots to minimize the pain of the community. One is about the extent of criminalization of our politics, and the other about the utter unreliability of our police force in the critical situation. So if your government is not going to allow you to do certain things, and the police is not going to protect, then what else can you do? And this is a statement from uh, Justice Tarkunde. Uh, so if you don't, so you, basically he's saying you can't go by what police says, and you can't go by what government says. Well then what's left is our narratives, the survivors' narratives, people who find the reports from the ground at the time, whether they were six or not six. That's what you have to go by from Indian Supreme Court who's saying this. So why do we keep uh, repeating, this is the issue I have with a large part of the Sikh community, and those who even try to contextualize November and June 84, we keep repeating the narrative of police and the government. Whereas people who have studied this issue, they say the two things you cannot rely on is the government's narrative and the police narrative. Okay. This is just a secret I was mentioning you earlier. Let's look at what he is saying. The Prime Minister's assassination was seized upon as an opportune psychological pretext. Look at the vocabulary he's using to those bent on exploiting the tension for political and material gains to trigger off a massive, deliberate, planned onslaught on the life, property, and honor of the comparatively small but easily identifiable minority community. Now, this report also came up within, I think, two months of what happened when it happened. Not a sick report, again, if you think that this is a rhetoric of the six. This is Indian judiciary's retired judge saying. He's saying it had absolutely nothing to do with assassination of Mrs. Gandhi. 
He says, but that's what was used as a pretext. In fact, the word he uses is opportune psychological pretext. And the agenda was kill, loot, and burn. Kill, loot, and burn. So when we look at pictures of that time, and if you want many more documentable, documented and admissible pictures, which Mr. Kulka has already reported, you can go to his website called carvajuni4.com. Everything on their website is what is already admitted in uh, Indian course. Uh, the, this is what you have. Cycle, you know, this is the hair cutting, this is the burning. In fact, uh, uh, I think you already know about the graphic and bloodiness of the situation. What we must understand is not to keep repeating the persecutor's narrative. That's what I'm after. Because that narrative is not supported by even the retired judiciary uh, justices of Indian courts. Because he's saying, you know, so don't say this happened because you hear this. People will say, well, this happened because you know, the Prime Minister was killed. That's a bunch of baloney. Anyone who has studied this are saying this was going to happen regardless. This was called Operation Shanti. This is what they were going to do in the rest of India. But they said, well, this is the right time to do it. In fact, uh, uh, in the Rashi, uh, it was sort of rushed, it was pre porn that when Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated. More psyche and more votes, and I'll come to the politics of this in a minute. Uh, let's look at this tour. The bodies beside the track were all six, so if all the bodies are six, how is this arrived? You know, these are the common sense questions we should be asking. This is what the press is reporting. Some had burned, while others burned to death. The six were pulled from train by an Hindu mob outside New Delhi to face a slow death. But this has interesting historical sort of a correlation as well. Maybe some of you have read the book Train to Pakistan, or maybe you have read that or read or heard of narratives about partition of 1947. This was a very common phenomenon then, that any train which were coming from India to Pakistan were full of death bodies, dead bodies of Hindus and Sikhs. Any train which was leaving from the Indian side to go to our Lahore side was full of dead bodies of Muslims. So this is how both sides were doing things, killing each other. Interesting thing in 84 is, even after June 1984 of what happened in Punjab, no train coming out of Punjab had Hindu dead bodies in it. But any train in November 84, which was going towards north from anywhere in India, was full of dead bodies of six. So you know when this thesis is constructed, six are violent, they were killing Hindus. You gotta ask the question about where is the data? You know, you guys are all university students. Uh, one of the studies is, uh, they say, how do you know, what do you know? That's what's called epistemology. So we don't just want statements, we want to see the data. And by the way, the data on genocidal campaigns worldwide, the leading authority of that, which does statistical analysis on this is called Benedict. Go Google that. Benedict just produced a report about Punjab, a preliminary report as to what happened in the last 27 years. And their statistical analysis is absolutely uh, that whatever happened in Punjab, the targets were six at large. So now reports are coming out uh, with data. And these are some of the train pictures. You know, The point <coughs> they made is that dead bodies were all six. Trains which are going to the north, passing through Delhi, are full of, dead full of sick dead bodies. No train coming out of Punjab going anywhere north of, uh, south of Punjab was full of, uh, there were no dead bodies in there. So there is one sided attack, orchestrated by the government, implemented by people at large, and I'll come to that in a minute as well. Okay, remember the genocidal uh, definition, the first, uh, uh, the article two of the convention, UN convention on genocides? The two phrases are systematic and widespread. The politics of genocide is, it doesn't matter how many people are killed. It could be one person, it could be thousand, it could be hundred thousand. The key phrases which you have to prove are, was it systematic and was it widespread? So here is a response which kind of talks to that. The initial knee-jerk response systematic and organized outbreak of bloodletting. Six were stabbed, burned, and butchered to death. So when people say, you know, mobs did it, when people say, uh, this was a revenge because of Mrs. Gandhi's assassination. When people say there were goons or gundas did it, it's just not true. Because that would have been sporadic. How come the exact pattern emerges in West Delhi, in South Delhi, and Trans Jamna, in Kanpur, in Jansi, where I live? It's the same thing. 
you can't have a systematic approach and a widespread approach because it's not in one locale. Within West Delhi, within Trans Jamna, it's in major locales wherever Sikhs are living. It's the same system. Kill the men, uh, including boys, identify them by their long hair, burn their house, rape their women, loot the property. It's the same thing everywhere. And this is where, I mean, some of this stuff uh, you've seen, I'm sure, in other places. But again, I'm just trying to present that when you are given uh, a stereotypical propaganda of the state machineries, you have to start asking some relevant questions. And the, one other thing which emerges is that it was systematic and widespread. Okay. Um, is it a genocide? Well, you know, even India Today, which again, I'm not a fan of any of these Indian publications I'm citing, but you know, if I only give you the Sikh narratives and you'll be like, you're biased, which I am, because you know, anyone who has survived this, how can you tell me I'm not biased? I've seen it in front of my eyes. So, days of violence and loot and murder left the national capital dazed, an unprecedented holocaust. Criminally led hoodlum killed six, looted or burnt homes and properties while police twit twiddled their thumbs. Now, India Today in 84 is the leading magazine of India. By any means, they're not six sympathizers. It's actually one of the party's political magazine. They, they took a particular editorial bank. You know, it's just like, you know, the new Guardian paper here writes a particular way and other mainstream and tabloids write a particular way. So India today, by any means, has no six sympathizers. Even then they are saying this. And look at the words they use. Holocaust has particular psychological elements to it. The words like, um, and, in, uh, and then other things that police, they have contextualized what police was doing. Either they're bystanders or they're participants. In fact, I will go as far as to say, in those three days, if you go by Manushi's, which is the only uh, journal which went to camps to come up with a number figure as to how many people were killed, everything else is more legal definition as to what they're able to establish, not based on the ground at the time. Manushi puts a number just for Delhi alone to be 10,000. If you divide that by 48 hours, you get one sick death every three minutes. That's what happened in Delhi only. Forget other cities. One sick is killed every three minutes. Are you telling me that this wasn't systematic and this wasn't widespread? There's something majorly wrong with this. Because that's what happened in those three days. And it should, makes you think about what's happening every three minutes. OK. Now, let me add a couple of things to it. I was in a city called Jhansi at that time, which is in a state called UP, Uttar Pradesh. Um, I lived in an area where there were maybe three, four, four sick families in that neighborhood. City doesn't have a large sick population. Our house was burned down. To make a long story short, we discovered who it was. We found out who ordered the killings. They were not the Congress in our area, they were Jansung. Jansung is a precursor to today's BJP, which is part of the right wing Hindu fundamentalist party in India, which participates in election. They're part of a larger organization called San Parvara. You know, BJP, RSS, Bajrandal, Shiv Sena, VHP, Vishnu Hindu Parishad, all these organizations are part of this large conglomerate. That's what they did there. I mean, my dad actually caught one of the guys who came to a burn our house. We reported him to police. He was released on the second day. No, no questions asked. I remember people coming to her house, uh, the, the religious leaders of the time, at the time in the city, in our neighborhood, particularly Arya Samajis, if you are not familiar with them, they are one of the subgroups who created, who developed 100 years ago in Punjab, something called Shuddhi ceremony, which used to be, if you are a Sikh and you reconvert back to Hinduism, they used to call it cleansing ceremony. They started that in Punjab uh, during Sikh Sabha movement. Those guys came to our house and they said, you know, we need to display solidarity that Hindus and Sikhs are on the same page. So uh, four days later, there was a procession taken out in my city where the agreed upon slogan was, Hindu Sikh Bhai Bhai, you know, that's Hindus and Sikhs are brothers. On the day of the procession, the phrase became Hindu Hindu Bhai Bhai. We are like, what the, you know. I mean, this is blatant on your face, what is happening. The only saving grace in our case happened to be that the deputy commissioner of our city, Mr. Kashyap, actually ordered two policemen to go to every Sikh house and stand guard after some of the killings and looting and burning was taking place. And that's probably how they survived. Uh, the two policemen uh, stood outside our door actually with loaded guns. Um, anyway, a 
exceptional Hindus as good neighbors. Yes, and I'm saying exceptional on purpose. Even in our neighborhood, our next door neighbor didn't help, the one next to him didn't help, but the guy who lived third house down the road, he came. In fact, I remember us sleeping in his house because our house was burned down for next two, three days before we made other arrangements. And that guy, second day in the market, was mishandled for protecting six. So yes, there were individual acts, but I will call those acts in human spirit. There were no systematic efforts to protect six. There were a few daring individuals who did do it. I remember uh, going back to India after years. Uh, I never went back to India once we moved out because there was a lot of anger and other issues, issues were going through my head. And when you are an angry teenager, you know you're capable of anything and everything irrational. But eventually, at some point, when I dealt with it, I went back to India. I went back to De in, in that city where I was, where I grew up, where I was born, and I went to see that neighbor. And you know, I just, I just wanted to thank him because the idea is this is the guy who actually dared in a mob mentality to come out and still, uh, what I would say, uh, operate with a human spirit. It's a very tough thing to do for anyone, whether you are a Sikh or not. And this guy was a Hindu guy. Um, I mean, I've talked about other things, so I'll move on. A little bit about the politics of numbers now. Now, these are the figures you will see, and I've just pulled out three major ones. Let me talk about them. Government report eventually admitted to 2,733 people killed. Eventually, it is operating there as well. So if you ask and look at government reports on them, these are the numbers they agree to. Mr. Folka, who is a lawyer who has been fighting these cases, on behalf of the survivors and those who were killed in 84 in Delhi, he is, his admissible evidence, so he doesn't say there are only 4,000 people killed. He's a, because he's a lawyer, he has to prove it. He says he's only able to legally prove 4,000. And that's what he's fighting for. Affidavits which are submitted in Indian courts, and every single affidavit is available on the Punjab Digital Library if you want to check it out. There are 5,015 affidavits which are admissible, not the ones which were filed, which the courts agreed that this many people have been killed. Madhu Keshwar, remember, I mentioned to her, uh, she's the editor of Malushi Journal. She, her estimate, the first estimate which came out, which was based on her uh, collections of anecdotes and stories at the relief camp, the very first estimate, she puts the number and she still stands by it to be at least 10,000 in Delhi alone. And remember, I'm not including the figures of Kanpur and the city I lived in southern cities of Bidar and other places where some of these events took place, just in Delhi. Now, let's put a spin on it a bit. India claims to be the largest democracy of the world. This is in the capital of the largest democracy of the world, where the administration failed, police failed, army failed, media failed, where a professor who is a leftist professor, now very celebrated throughout the world, if you've heard of his name, Amitabh Ghosh, he is a, he's a known South Asian writer, lives in New York now, he put out an article in New Yorker magazine at the 10th anniversary of November 84. And if you guys haven't seen the article, I highly recommend you Google it and read it. The article is called Ghosts of Mrs. Gandhi. And he admits in there, he says, if a leftist progressive professor like me was not able to speak up about it and it's taken him 10 years to do it, he says, I can understand how an average person not only won't speak against it, he will actually participate in it. So he is admitting to that Average person there was for all this. And I'll establish that in a minute, how average person was all for it. Rajiv Gandhi, when he came to Delhi at the airport, he made this statement, when a big tree falls, the earth trembles. The statement is justifying the killing of six. That's what he's saying. He says, Indira Gandhi is a big tree. She fell. Well, whatever is happening is fine. He is a, in fact, it was a response to this court that Mr. Fulka and Manoj Mitta, a senior correspondent for Times of India newspaper, they have put out a book three years back, and uh, uh, when the tree shook Delhi. So they have given a response to that, not only did administration not uh, conspire to kill more Sikhs, but they actually made statements to justify the killings. And this is one of those statements. Who became the leader of, he became the Prime Minister of India, and how did he become Prime Minister? Wars were pre war And this is a pattern which all of you need to understand very well. India, you know, there were elections called. The elections were supposed to be the following year in 85. There were these killings in November. You know how the parliamentary system works. You know, the, the sitting party can pre the elections. 
Stephen Harper has done this, your own prime ministers have done it here, the leading party, when they think they can win. Right after these killings, elections are pre polled and Congress, the party in power, gets voted into power with larger margins. Same thing happened in Gujarat. If you know when they killed Muslims there in 2002 Gujarat, elections are pre polled and Mr. Modi wins with highest margins ever. So this is how you know that regular constituency is okay with the person who did the killings because they vote them back into power. Again, Nazi style, when more killings were happening of Jews, the Germans were okay with it and they were okay with supporting Hitler and doing so. So an average Indian, yeah, it's hard to digest, but that's what the data is saying, that they voted those people into power, those who did the killings. Now, again, to contextualize with other events in India, in, the, in, in 84 itself, there's a union carbide accident, you know, where Dow Chemical, Gas is released and several people die in Bhopal, central India. People who, there's an opening of parliament in 1985 after an election. Uh, there is a motion on Indira Gandhi's recognition. There's a motion to recognize the victims of Bhopal. No mention of anything about sex. So people who were killed in a leak accident, they are mentioned. Indira Gandhi, of course, is supposed to be mentioned because he was a prime minister previously. But in the largest, I mean, in the capital city, where this much has happened, there is, there's a complete silence. This is what Patwan Singh started calling that in India there exists a culture uh, or a conspiracy of silence. And the human rights world will tell you, whether it's Amnesty or Human Rights Watch or your local organizations like Redress and Minority Rights Group International, they'll all tell you number one enemy of human rights is silence. This is a problem in sick households as well. There's a yes, to it, so we don't talk about it. The number one enemy of any human right violation is silence. So at minimum, we need to stop being silent. In terms of compensations, people who died in that Bhopal accident, they were given $100,000 per victim. In Delhi, eventually, government gave 10000 It just shows you at every level, there's no recognition. Even when they recognize it, they're not giving proper compensations and there's orchestration as to how all these things get done. Well, interestingly, since 1984 till today, there have been 11 commissions and inquiries. And you know in India, this is the delay mechanism. I asked Mr. Pulka this last Saturday, to be a sick Asian student invited to do a webinar to give update on the court cases he's fighting. And he's on record saying is, you can go to our website and listen to his 40 minutes of updates on what happened. One of the questions he was asked was, uh, why is there a delay? I'm sure a lot of you have this question. 27 years and counting, and why is there such a delay? And he said, he said, basically there are only two reasons. If you keep delaying it, witnesses keep dying, they are bought, they are forced, and you'll have tough time finding convictions. Simple as that. Just like there's orchestration in those days to control the information, to control the carnage as to who does it and, who, and people are not able to fight against it, he says similar things are happening now. The ruling party with so-called independent judiciary, it still tries to put enough mechanisms in place. He says in some cases, CBI, which is a Central Bureau of Intelligence, is sort of like your MI5. They are not even giving reports on what has happened. So there's a delay after delay after delay. So eventually witnesses die. The, like one of the cases which is in India right now is to convict Sajjan Kumar. Sorry, Jagdish Reitler. Sajjan Kumar case is going on. Here are the three surviving members. All three of them have served in Indian Parliament's cabinet. So sitting party has awarded them cabinet positions. It's like, I don't know, I mean, if, uh, if India claims to be a democracy and it gives a cabinet position to somebody who has convictions against them pending, conviction is the wrong word, proceeding against them pending in, the, in Indian courts about killing people in why are they being these cabinet positions? That tells you who's being rewarded. And they have shifted them around here and there, but uh, this is Jagdish Titler, uh, Sajjan Kumar, and Kamal Nath. And just to give you one other thing, not only are they given cabinet positions, like one of them was made NRI minister. NRI is non-resident Indian. So if you're a non-resident Indian, you want to file a complaint against India, you have to go through his office. So if you're a diaspora Sikh or a diaspora Indian, and you don't like certain things in India, you got to go through one of these guys. Obviously, they're not going to record it. Remember how the police manipulation occurs? That FIR is not going to be filed, and they don't care what you're saying. Now, 11 commissions in inquiry in 27 years. 
something to think about is there have been more commercial inquiries than commissions. So there have been cases pending, there have been trials, one of the guys who orchestrated this died in the middle, HKL Bhagat. Last week, to again make it even more relevant, there was a killing of an officer named Kuldeep Singh, SPO, Special Police Officer in Punjab. This guy's testimony was used to convict uh, assassination of Jaswant Singh Khalada, the guy who collected evidence in Punjab, which Supreme Court of India admitted that there were extrajudicial killings in Punjab. To get that conviction, there is an officer of two Indian police, Punjab police officers. One of those police officers is Kuldeep Singh. He has 10 security guard. Indian government has provided to protect him, and he was killed last week. You know why? Because his testimony was going to be used very soon against KPS Gill. This is what happens in India. This is not an old thing, this is last week's thing. KPS Gill, for the first time, the butcher of India, uh, has to produce himself in the court now. And the testimony which would have been used to possibly convict him, you know, the mechanism is you got to go through the judicial system. One of those two testimonies, the guy who's, who said that we killed just one Singh Khalada, we threw his body in Harike, which is a river um, uh, outside Amrassar area. That guy was eliminated, although Indian police had provided their own 10-person uh, bodyguards to him. Very weird stuff is happening. In their three cases, you know, uh, there's a lady, whether you go by Darshan Court's testimony, whether you go by Nirupama's testimony, they have been trying to be coerced by sick looking leaders. They have been, they have tried to buy them. The Congress, this is the last commission of India which reported on what happened. This is Indian government's commission which reported in February 2005. And this is what they said. The systematic manner in which the Sikhs were thus killed indicates that the attacks on them were organized. So they recognized there was organized attack. But look at the next part. The commission is not in a position to recommend any action against them except to the extent indicated earlier while assessing the evidence against them. So basically, they neither indicted nor exonerated the perpetrators. What that means is they're recognizing we kill people six in a systematic manner, but more than this, we can't do anything. Uh, what are you supposed to do with it? They're saying, yeah, we did it, but I don't know about bringing the guilty to the law, to the court, even trying them. So what the hell do you do with these kind of commissions? You know, there's a, there's, you know, the idea of commission or tribunals or commissions is to figure out how to deal with these issues. They're saying, well, uh, well one thing is, by 2005, at least they recognized they were systematically attacked, six were. But even at that level, government refuses to give, do anything about it. And what happens when you refuse to do things about it? Well, here is Jaskaran Kaur, the only organization I know who is systematically working to work, fight impunity in India. I know there are other people doing it, but I'm giving it. They are the ones who did a legal analysis of what happened in November 84. If you want to read 100 pages on that, pick up a book called 20 Years of Impunity. That's what Jaskaran wrote. He's a Harvard trained lawyer. Four people who work in this organization, three of them are Harvard trained lawyers. They can make you know, 500,000 a year doing other things, but they're putting their lives, they have invested the last eight years to systematically document, critique, analyze, and go to court with the lawyers in India to fight this in a legal way. This is what she has written. The Gujarat program of early 2002, when the state leaders of BJP organized massacre of the Muslims, demonstrated the result of failing to hold state actors accountable for previous gross rights violations of human rights such as the November 1984 massacre of the Sikhs. Pogroms will recur in India unless the state acknowledges and records these violations in a transparent and honest manner towards cleansing itself of the people and institutions that perpetrate these crimes and addressing the survivor's right to knowledge, justice, and reparation. So we can say, what she's essentially saying is, if there were Bombay attacks of 95, if, there, if what happened in Gujarat 2002, the reason these things keep happening in India is because it's proven in India that state will not do anything to you if you keep doing these things. And she's saying, when somebody says, let's move on, I want to talk about that too, you cannot move on unless these three things are done. Not survivors' right to knowledge. What really happened? 
This is, you know, people talk about truth commissions and Nelson Mandela. Well, when there were truth commissions set up in South Africa, this is what they worked at, right to knowledge. Even today, that's not occurring from the government side. Justice is the next step. What are you going to do with those? Okay, if, even if you're not going to hang them, are you going to give them cabinet positions in the Indian government? What's the message are you sending? And then the reparation is, how are you going to deal with the survivors and the victims, including their emotional and psychological traumas and addressing of those things? None of this is happening. So what happens is, uh, November 84 is, a, is, is, is continuing towards other minorities in India. And this is the recurring theme. So if you are an Indian, I mean, not just as a Sikh, as an Indian, they should be concerned about this. Where is this country heading? And I'll speak to that in a minute. Since a lot of you are Sikhs here, almost all of you are Sikhs from Sikh background, these are the three things I want you guys to think about. We might not be in a position to do certain things, but nobody's holding a gun to your head to at least think about this. So I don't know if any one of you have any excuse to say, well, I can't do anything. Yes, you can. You know those survivors who are sitting in Nazi gas, ch gas chambers? You should read their testimonies. They're very powerful. One of the testimonies of survivors is that Hitler thinks that he's killed me and he's got to me, but he still doesn't know that he doesn't control my mind. 95% of Guru Granth Sahib focuses on the word man. Almost every Shabbat talks about the word man. Man is something like mind, a place where your thoughts originate. Who is stopping us from thinking about these things? We're not even doing that. Do Sikhs remember how Jassa Singh Abdul Wadi responded? My point here is, as Sikhs, do we know our narratives? When there was a Vada Kandukara, Chota Kandukara, when in 1762 half of the Sikh population was killed in one day, what did Sikhs do at the time? Did they keep asking the government of the time to give us justice, or did they employ other means? They captured Sarhand in three months, when half of the Sikh population was killed in one day. And they captured Amritsar. Darwarsa was desecrated in 1762. They captured Amritsar in nine months. Something we need to learn from our history. Our ways were different. And are we changing our ways? In post-84, our ways have changed. Now we are also burning effigies. Sikhs never did this. When Sikhs were killed, they never complained to the world authorities that give us rights or, you know, we need a right to turban and you go to the same party which has killed you. That's what we are doing these days. Something is majorly wrong with the way we are thinking. That's why I'm bringing to the thinking part. What made Baba Deep Singh not sit quietly at age of 75? So this age issue, you know, don't just think of Baba Deep Singh as in somebody who became a martyr at 82. What was he doing between 24 and 82? This is about planning. This is about thinking. This is about what needs to occur within the community to create an environment where proper responses can come out. And how can more Darshan courts become public voices? This is the lady whose family members have been killed. I remember we did, about five years ago, we were part of a team which produced the Widow Colony uh, documentary. And we said, we are going to release this in India. We invited the Attorney General of India, the Law Minister of India. And we asked Darshan Kaur to speak there. This is what I remember from that day. Shwarsi said, I don't want to do it. You know, there are so many important dignitaries are sitting and we had invited who's who of Delhi. Uh, administration and other people. No, we said, no, they need to hear from you. We don't need manufactured speeches. We need to hear from what you're going through. She gets up on the stage, and this is what she says. She says, and I'm loosely translating because her language was Hindi at the time. She said, you guys have reduced us to an incident. We are not an incident. This is still real to us. We are still fighting to get justice. Think about it. We have reduced this to an incident. First of all, it is not just an incident, but this is what we have reduced it to. Secondly, we think it was way back. She's still living it. She's the one fighting the Congress leaders, the sick, bought out politicians, the money which is being brought to her to buy her out. She's still fighting all this stuff while living in poverty and stress. We need to bring more of those voices up. If you are able to, then support. I'm going to put in my organization, but there are other organizations doing awareness generation. People who are actually fighting this in a legal manner, if that's your calling. And there are survivors education projects going on, if you want to sponsor them. Don't give money to people because you think they have emotionally told you to do certain things. This is the biggest problem in the community again. You are the smart people. Find out, ask them for an annual report. Tell them to show you a data as to what this kid has done. Enough money has been collected in their community which never makes it to the survivor. 
you, you need to become smarter about these things. You know, the, uh, all the training in universities should make us develop a little bit of common sense as to who should be supported with these kind of things. Okay, I'm almost done. So how do you increase knowledge? Well, there are a lot of things available. Yes, go read Indian government's white paper. You must be aware of what they are saying. But how about reading other things? And I'll just put a few things here. Uh, this is the legal analysis I was talking about. This is Manoj Mitra and uh, Mr. Kunka's book. This is Cynthia Kepley's book. This is Ganesha Kaur, 84, born, somebody who's born in America afterwards. And she's reconstructing what happened based on the available information in the public domain. And this one was produced here as to uh, what happened in 1984. If you don't like to read, I know a lot of us don't. You like watching movies and documentaries? You don't have an option. Have you seen Amu, Kaya, Karan, My Mother India, the Middle Quality? There's lots of stuff available to understand what happened. And if you have done all that, we need to start a rural history tradition. What I mean by that is, it'll cost you 50 bucks to get a small, in fact, you need to do your phones probably can do this now. I'm, I'm citing this, you know, where the Statue of Liberty is in Ellis Island in New York City. Recently, I went to the museum, and when people were landing in America, they have recorded why they're landing. Most of the testimonies, whether they're Irish American, Italian American, mostly Europeans at the time, Western Europe, primary reason people were landing in America was political and religious freedom. You know several people who have come here after 84. They have lived through some of these things. When you don't even have basic data like that, start collecting. Ask in your own family. And it doesn't cost much to do this. If you have enough of these testimonies, and if somebody can sit there and do a statistical analysis of this, you have a raw data, you can start providing more evidence. This is what happened in South America. There's an organization called, basically, uh, a father in the Catholic Church. Catholic Church told him not to do this, but they're called Mothers of Revolution. Basically, uh, the mothers and grandmothers worked with the church group to secretly record all these testimonies, and eventually they were brought out in public to get conviction in South America. So, at least do it in your family and the people you know who survived. There are literary and artistic expressions which are coming out now, which is great to see uh, that this is not reduced to just uh, you know, people are the print. There are, there are what we call historical fictions are being written now about it. People are, you know, singing about it. Uh, people are writing about it. There's a novel written about it, which is a welcome thing. And this is the last one, um, me being a public enemy fan. Those of you know the rap group from America. You know, before you fight for your right, you have to fight to fight for your right to fight. You know, most people don't realize it is our birthright to be whatever we want to be. It is our right to know what happened. How the hell somebody can tell us that forget about this been 25 years or 27 years. That uh, minister I was telling you about, uh, Soli Sorabji, who was India's, uh, uh, not just only the Attorney General of India, but he was also a special rapporteur to UN for the Committee on Human Rights and Torture. This is what he said when he saw the movie. He said, my father died of natural causes, and I still do something in my home to remember him every year. He says, where the community has been killed and where they have been murdered, how can anyone tell them not to remember this day? Think about this. Punjabi community does this all the time. You know, we have something called varsis, right? We remember and do a gun parts and do a langar in the memory of our forefathers and foremothers. Here, collectively, the Sikh nation has gone through this. And how can anyone tell us not to remember this? Something to think about. So I would say before you get busy doing anything, at least inform yourself, concerned with those who are in the field, then figure out how to elaborate on the power. The reason I'm showing this is most of us, when we come to events like these, we get a little bit worked up, we get a little bit emotional, and a couple of days later, everything dies. Some of us might move and say, let's do this, let's connect some money, let's do this. You know, you might even cuss few words when you walk out of this room. But eventually, all of that dies down. We run out of our gas. Well, some of us might actually go try to raise money and send money. All I'm saying is, don't just become a busybody. Number one thing is to think about things. Enough of money has been lost. Enough of energy and synergy has been lost in the community because we did not do this stuff systematically. And we use a rhetoric that we are not unified, that's why nothing is happening. That's a rhetoric. Unity means people who work, they work together. You need to find people who are in the field with track record and work with them. 
And if you don't find anyone, start your own thing. Nobody's stopping you from doing it. You just don't have an option not to do anything. That's what I'm trying to get at. So what's next at a larger level? Well, at minimum, if India is serious, one in seven person in the world is Indian right now. And Indians better become serious about this because this is not just a Sikh issue now, it has become a Gujarat issue, a Muslim issue, a Dalit issue, a Hellen issue, a Kashmiri issue. There are enough reports to show what is happening in India by international agencies. India really needs to think about doing either of these two things. There are truth commissions in South Africa, Salvador, and Guatemala. So we're not asking them to do something out of order, extraordinary, out of ordinary. They all do court actions, right? They did in Rwanda, Argentina, and Chile. In India, both things have happened. We have had some convictions for 1984, but very small fish. People who were at the lowest level, like the guy who threw an axe, killed one of the guys. Yes, we want that conviction, but the larger conviction will be those who ordered it. Those who are given uh, those in police, those in the administration. The guy in charge of securities in India, his title in India is called Home Minister. Home Minister of India is supposed to be in charge of securities. You know there was a breakdown in security. Guess how he was rewarded? Mr. Rao became a Prime Minister in India after a few years as well. This is what needs to stop. The processes in India needs to be, are, is India going to continue the culture of impunity? Or are they going to put processes in place so there is a protection of minority rights? Uh, so redressing architects and orchestrators is very important. This is the Human Rights Watch report. Actually, Human Rights Watch on the 25th anniversary of November 84 went to Delhi and did a seminar there. And this was the conclusion of that seminar. Can India be the conscience for the world? So they are saying, let's appeal to Indian conscience. The Indians are getting smart. They are buying British and American companies. They got the money. They got the brain power. They are becoming professors from LSC to Oxford to MIT and Harvard. So it's not that they don't have the intellectual capital. Human Rights Watch said, can they really have a conscience to actually do something about what's happening in India? This was two years ago. And they were basically saying, India has a choice. They can work on both human rights and economic development. And let's say if they can do both. Two years later, we know they haven't done the human rights part. They're definitely continuing on economic development part. And I don't need to give you a lesson on that. You can pick up a local issue of the Economist magazine and they'll tell you what India is going through. So India chooses. And when I say India, it's Indians who are representative in the agencies of India, outside of Indian agencies, also in leftist universities like JNU and even progressive newspapers like Asian Age, even they choose not to really follow the human rights dictum. So I think the challenge remains to Indians. You know, do they just want to create more corporate slavery is how the world is running? And you've seen what happened here uh, two days ago, yesterday. It was very refreshing to see that a Canterbury will actually make a political statement to show what the purpose of church is here. They reverted their decision within 24 hours after making a wrong decision. Where in the heck in India you know, there's a Shankaracharya in India, there's a Jathedar in India, there is uh, leaders of all sorts of so-called the land of spirituality. Nobody makes statement, including the Dalai Lama, the guy who's ambassador of peace. He stays in India since pre or prior to 84. He's yet to make any statement about any minority persecution in India. I wonder about this. The only person who made a statement on what happened in 1984, only international religious leader who made a statement was uh, John Pope, uh, John Paul II. He in fact gave a very graphic statement that this is unacceptable as to what Mrs. Gandhi has done in India and uh, the country of India needs to do something to make sure this is never done again. The only international religious leader. So this is, I would say, something for us to think about. If somebody says they're spiritual, are they really being spiritual if they are continue to be in the conspiracy of silence when people are being killed in front of them, yet they keep giving assurances that you'll get to heaven in the next life? It doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> I mean, who's going to come back, I guess, from the life to ask for their money back for the money you give to spiritual leaders? It's a bunch of bullshit. What's happening in front of you, you can't do anything about it, but you're giving guarantees that you'll get to some space called heaven and you'll get all these whatever they are going to get. I'm going to end there. Uh, today, the agenda was to give you some uh, contextualization to 1984, to give you some ammunition to not repeat the state narrative, but develop a second narrative of it, and also a few ideas on 
how you can uh, talk about this issue, at least debate about this issue. This needs to become a talking point. This needs to show up, and this is what I'm working on with Al-Saab and our organizations. This needs to be part of the curriculum. How, we are, how do you know about the Holocaust? Because you're taught from day one. Are there Holocaust deniers? You bet there are. Do we repeat their stories? No, we don't. And these are the choices we have to make. How do we get into the system where people talk about it? There are enough evidence about it. Indian courts have admitted this. They refuse to do anything about it. But how do we teach this such that, that you and I, when we are growing up, when our brain is getting wired, we are wired to respond to these things and not, when, when we see atrocity in front of us, we don't become the same silent spectator. That's the idea. The presentation was about 1984 and um, just about the overall implications, um, both the political dynamics as well as the overall um, effect on the Sikh, Sikh psyche. Um, it was very informative. It was it touched on a lot of statistical aspects and also also talked about um, some of the things that can be done from our perspective going forward. So yes, it was quite inspiring as well. What do you think of the event that you've just been to? I thought the event was excellent. Um, it's very informative, um, and also um, I found that um, it portrayed Sikh grievances in a uh, quite an articulate way, um, which is um, not like the traditional way that Sikhs generally portray how they feel about 1984. It's normally like a fire and brimstone kind of approach, and I felt that in this instance, um, it was far more articulate and cohesive, and kind of gave Sikhs a voice as to why they feel the way they do. I think that's really important. Are you inspired by any of the things that I said in terms of doing things or getting involved? Yeah, I did have some, uh, some knowledge of uh, what, had, what had occurred, but um, I wasn't aware of all the resources that were available out um, to, to us in terms of Sikhs. So definitely in terms of informing a change in my life personally, I think it was very inspiring. I think one of the things that was said was about the, the, um, the beauty of the literature that's out there and uh, getting equipped with the literature too. Do you agree with that? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, um, I think uh, we as Sikhs uh, try to use an excuse that there is not an awareness or that we don't have the resources available to us, particularly even within the younger generation. Um, and I felt that, you know, by the presentation here and everything that, was, that we were taught that, you know, there is a lot of opportunities for us as Sikhs to read into these issues and in a kind of academic and westernised way, which is the way we, most of Sikhs outside of India have been brought up. Thanks, thanks very much indeed. Um, it's very insp inspirational. Uh, the way he presents information in a way where he backs it up with research, it's very unique and I think we just need more people like him. That's pretty much all I can do. The presentation, can you tell us your impressions of it? Uh, did you learn something and um, how are you inspired going forward? Uh, yeah, I think uh, by uh, having the CG was uh, really, really good. I've been to one of his other uh, lectures actually, and I think it's really inspirational. I often say, like he was saying, like you sort of you go home, you want to do something, and after a day, a couple of days, it fizzles out. But I think with this, hopefully, it will stick. And I asked him for contact details. He's like, if you go to their website and they've got resources, then we can start to actually try to make something happen because it's only been 27 years and justice still hasn't been served. So I think it's about time we. Um, um, I thought it was very informative and I didn't know about November 1984 until today, so I learned quite a lot. And uh, one of the questions um, that was uh, pitched was for, for the initiative to be with yourselves to actually uh, go and learn more and get hold of the literature. Yeah. What's your view on that? Yeah, I think he's right because um, there's one way, like, well, traditionally in the Sikh history, we sort of go and we sort of get them physically, if you know what I mean. But um, I think that's still important. But I think now, because of, like, you know, the way we're all set up, uh, we've got to sort of know our history and do it like the um, sort of Norway. So, how uh, by Bill uh, Gaji is doing, he's taken to um, the courts and stuff. I think we've got to do that. And one way we can do that is, well, one of the only ways, really, is by reading our history and then um, reading all the books that he suggested. Absolutely. And uh, do you think that um, you have a, a view of the fact that 27 years is a very long time? You mentioned it before. Um, there are a lot of people that have actually been named uh, as yeah. possible perpetrators. Yeah. Um, what's your view on the Indian courts in terms of trying to get and uh, pursue justice? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't really think they, they have justice in this system. They, I mean, to think that people who have obviously been um, connected to it, I mean, you can go on YouTube, you can see people like the Widow Connolly, they're like um, saying they sort of say Sajjan Kumar 
inciting the mobs and he's giving government positions. I don't see how that could be fair. I mean, I don't know why people don't just empathise with other people's situations. If we did, we wouldn't be in this position now. It would, you know, that's what we have. Yeah, I agree with what she said. Well, thanks very much indeed. I really appreciate your time. Uh, the, uh, the presentation on 1984 that you've just seen with uh, Harinder Singh. Um, I thought it was uh, very informative and uh, this is a subject that's debated every year at this time and uh, it's very easy to get emotive and emotional and stir up feelings of aggression but this was very matter of fact which is what I liked hard facts based with evidence you know and as uh, Vice Abdi indicated with non-seek evidence so that you know any element of bias gets eliminated I thought that was fantastic because yeah, any community can say, you know, you Sikhs are biased, it's your community, you don't want to look bad. But, you know, by presenting the whole picture, I feel, you know, now more than ever that Sikhs have got ammunition to go out there and, you know, tell the world what really happened. I think the point being made where am ammunition, part of ammunition is also having the literally knowledge, yes. you know, about what's been written. And as the point that you've made about independent writing or even anthropologists that have gone in and actually done research on those communities or those cultures and said, look, there is definitely an issue here uh, of human rights that has clearly not been addressed and uh, justice is still uh, outstanding. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that point about uh, literature? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, we're both literature students, so oh, wow. I that's think I didn't know that. I, I, didn't know that. <laughs> I think we will really relate to that, and I think all of the different sources that were given and um, how um, the presentation, how it was given, I just think we're all interpreting in a different way, and we can all go off and look at the different sources that we want to see. I thought it was really insightful. On a kind of more uh, future career perspective, I mean, you're both doing literature. I don't know what your thoughts are. Are you interested in journalism and that kind of stuff? Um, I was, but I'm not anymore. I think I grew, I grew up a lot and I changed my mind. And first I wanted to take a law conversion. Right. And then I changed my mind again. I think I want to do my master's and PhD and become a okay. professor. So I'm not sure. Very good. But in terms of uh, the journalists that are out there, I mean, I, I've done a bit of research and I've seen that sometimes almost uh, historians who become journalists are sometimes lazy. Uh, there's a lot of information out there uh, and clearly it doesn't seem to be coming across. So what's your view on that? Um, I think every journalist is going to have a different opinion like whether in what kind of um, area they're in whether it's broadcast journalism or they're writing for newspapers like the guardian has a specific political political perspective on things it's not always going to be the same and um yeah do you so do they do they need to do more research to get their stories right or do you think there's a political agenda there they i think they definitely need to do more research because we only hear things from one side we, like mm. today i've learned so much and I can't wait to go out there and find out more about this because I've never heard facts like that before. I've always heard just a really biased anti-1984, anti-Bindarwale like stories and like after today I just think we, we all need to go out there and find out for ourselves because we're obviously not being given the, the complete information. Yeah, and then the, the irony is that the information is there if you look hard enough. Yeah, yeah. we're yeah. just getting the information that's been passed on to us from different people. and We've heard stories from other people who have heard stories. It's, I think this is just really good. And there's, I guess there's a dilution that happens as well over time, so it, it's important to go back to the facts, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. definitely. All right, well, thanks so much for your feedback. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.